planning commission um, start with the Pledge of Allegiance? I Pledge allegiance actually, to, the flag to the flag of the United States, States of, of America, America and, and to the Republic for which, for which it stands, now, one, one nation, nation under, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we uh, we all got the uh, <clears throat> minutes for the March first meeting. Uh, it looked fine to me. Did anyone have any changes, alterations, comments about the minutes? If so, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for March? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Unanimous, Trish? Yep, got it. All right. First up is uh, Eagle and Radnor Road uh, zoning hearing board application. Um, before, uh, Dave, is that you? It is, Matt, how are you? Very good, man. Before you get started, I'd, I'd just like to say that in terms of public comment, I would strongly urge and appreciate if the public comment was limited to the steep slopes issue here because that's what's in front of us tonight. This is not a development plan in front of us uh, and the applicants are gonna be back for final approval. Um, so just it, I, people are gonna get a chance to say their piece on this and I just would like the steep slopes issue to be what the public comments are directed at. Um, it's all yours, Dave. I appreciate it, thanks, Matt. So the, the Planning Commission is familiar with this application. We've been in front of you a few times as part of what you've just described, our land development application and our proposed map change. Um, we are not here to discuss those issues. Um, those issues have, as you know, been come through the Planning Commission and been recommended to the Board of Commissioners where they'll be heard um, at a later date. We're here tonight for a limited purpose of uh, receiving a recommendation from the Planning Commission with respect to a zoning application that's pending later this month with respect to disturbance of steep slopes on the site. It's uh, an issue I think that this Planning Commission has heard very recently um, and hears often in this township. The issue on this site that sits today is that the slopes that are there were, were man-made and the Radnor Township Ordinance does not make a concession for specifically man-made slopes. Where the ordinance does allow for an exclusion is where the steep slopes were created um, as a result of compliance with another section of the code, which is section 175.11. Ultimately, that's been interpreted by the township to say that if the slopes were created as a result of a grading permit issued, then you're exempt from having to comply with the provisions of the code. In this instance, these slopes were created well before the code itself was created. Um, I think staff's aware of these slopes, um, the township is aware of them, and I think pretty much anybody that views them will concede these were indeed man-made slopes. The way that they're constructed, the locations in which they're constructed that, however, does not carry the day in and of itself. Um, instead, the applicant needs to, to show, um, I guess, one of two things in a situation like this. One, that the ordinance itself is drafted in such a way that there's an ambiguity with respect to slopes, or they've got to show that they're entitled to a variance. The provision of the ordinance that controls this section is section 280.112, and that's the slope controls provision of the zoning ordinance. And the, the very language of the code states that there are certain directives, certain uh, desired outcomes when slopes are disturbed and what the ultimate desire of this provision of the code is, and that's to limit erosion and sedimentation, to protect watersheds, prevent the increase in possibilities of landslides, maintain adequate foliage and protect streams from increases in, in sediment. As we know from having heard this plan come through this planning commission, the current site is uncontrolled with respect to stormwater. So any development that came before this township with respect to this site, given the location of these slopes, 
would need relief. There's kind of no way around that. And our engineer, Rob Lambert, can speak to that when we get into some more specific discussions around what the slopes are. But as part of this application, we'd, we'd be in front of you, whether this were an R1 property, an R2, an R1A, any redevelopment of this site, even under PI, would, would require disturbance of slopes. And beyond that, because the site is uncontrolled today with respect to stormwater, part of what this applicant is doing is taking measures and taking steps to, make, to get the site controlled, to overdevelop stormwater. But beyond that, the applicant is also being sensitive to the natural features on the site, the, the trees, to allowing uh, those conditions to remain. There's a large parking lot in the middle of the site when you come in as part of the access point and the edges of that parking lot were sloped and created um, a man-made slope in that area and as a result in order to get rid of that parking lot which is just a sea of asphalt we have to disturb those slopes it puts us in a situation where had this application been submitted or had this site been developed with the homes that are on it and the parking lot that is on it in the year 2000. It would have come through the township, all of those slopes would have been permitted, and this developer would be exempt from having to comply with this provision. So it's a unique situation insofar as the conditions were created, not by this applicant, but they also preclude by right development because we can't, we can't navigate the site without touching slopes given their locations. And the slopes themselves are, like I said, next to the parking lot. They were put there to build the parking lot, parking lot up and create um, a level surface there as well as being next to the homes that were created on the site. As they currently exist, the slopes that are there contribute to runoff on the site. Um, they contribute to the uncontrolled situation and the stormwater uh, detriment that this site uh, puts forth. We believe that uh, development as we're proposing is uh, ultimately uh, a betterment for the site. It will control the stormwater. It will meet the very intent of the ordinance, which is to limit uh, some of those things that are happening today. And it will be ultimately in compliance with the code provisions that the, that the ordinance wants you to be in when you develop slopes, which is that section 175. <laughs> so I'm, God bless you. I'm going to um, turn this over to Rob Lambert to specifically discuss the slopes, but I wanted to frame some of the issues um, that are dealing just with the slopes tonight. Thanks, Dave. Hello, I'm gonna share my screen. I believe I have privileges, there we go. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay, so this is a, uh, a aerial from 1958 um, showing showing the site, and I'm just going to start here. So Eagle Road would go left to right, just past this area. You can see the Main Valley Forge. You can see St. David's Golf Club, and the site is this big open area, right in the kind of the center of this image. And so that was before the parking lot. And if you note, all the houses uh, are not shown in this picture. So after 1958, you can see an image here in 1965, where this parking lot was constructed. Um, and then through subsequent years, I'm gonna go through here, you can see by 1971, you can start to see the little houses, if you look closely, um, all start to show up on the site. So as Dave was explaining is, the site has been developed over years. Um, we've also looked at various USGS images, um, and we'll start at the top, you know, going back to 1894, uh, and then Eagle Road would be left to right at the angle. Uh, this is Radnor Street Road going kind of upper left to lower right. And all these are going to be in the same orientation. Um, again, going through 1952, you can see that there were two structures uh, closest to Eagle Road. And we'll see those on a subsequent image. Um, and then going through 1966, you can start to see some of the houses appear. You still have the two structures shown on the aerial or on the, on the map. And then by 1992, you see all of the houses um, that have been shown before to you. So I'm gonna go flip to this a plan. So this plan was 1992 aerial. 
So you can see there was an existing large structure. Eagle Road would have been left to right. You can see the parade grounds at Valley Forge. So there was a large structure and actually a secondary large structure uh, at the top of the hill. And then by 2002, um, those two buildings were actually removed. And you can see, so over the last, you know, 50, 75 years, this site has been in constant flux uh, over time. What I like to do here. So this plan is the plan I think that you've seen before. Eagle Road is on the left-hand side. Radnor Street Road is across the bottom. Walnut is on the right. And what we've done is we've highlighted the slopes. So um, kind of this reddish pink color. Um, those are slopes that, we, that are man-made slopes that we propose to remove. Um, and I'm going to go through each area as we go around. Uh, the kind of the teal were, were man-made slopes that we're really not touching. So we're just going to leave those as is. Um, the purple, it wasn't as clear uh, if those were man-made or not. So we've, we've left them and we're not touching any of those slopes. Uh, so I'll start with the large parking lot. So you can see the large parking lot that's accessed off of Radnor Street Road. Um, the whole site is sloping. So naturally when they built this, on the uphill side, they cut into the slope. And so that created this whole band of slopes coming down and around. And on the downhill side, again, they filled. So you created a cut condition on the uphill side, a fill condition on the downhill side. And then as you go around and start looking at all the houses, just simply naturally when they built the house, they created a flatter area um, and it was a slope. It was a 10% slope. It wasn't a steep slope, but it was a 10% slope. But in order to create the flat pad for the house, they cut on the uphill side of the slope. You can see that in this teal color and they filled on the downhill side. And I'll show you some specific pictures about each one of these. But again, the house, it filled on the low side, cut on the upside where they had this large structure at the top of the hill. They filled kind of all around it to create this, this plateau up top. And you can see the bands of slopes again out toward Radnor Street Road where they're filling around each house. And so it was just nestling the houses into the grade which created that. I'm going to go here. Hey Rob, are those houses split levels? Uh, many of them are uh, split level, I believe, yes. So that would like that the grading is different for a split level anyway, yeah. right? Right, and you're going to see that in some of these pictures. Um, I'll skip to the houses here. I'll go back so you can see, but you can see, um, you know, like this house was built, they flattened out where the house is, and then the downhill side becomes a slope, mm -hmm. right? It was just the natural area adjacent to the house. Here is a split level, um, and you can see just the way it was built, you know, you have the upper part, you have a slope going in where they had the access, um, but it was all all really disturbed. It wasn't naturally like this. Um, and then in the back of that same house, it's a little bit hard to see with the, with the vegetation here, but all around this back corner, you can kind of see where they have some timber walls is they created a flat yard. And to create the flat yard, they started digging into the, the hill above. Um, and, but I'll go back to the top there. I skipped down so you could see the picture you asked about. And so starting at the, at the upper area, so this is all the way up by, uh, there's a asphalt turnaround area at the top of the hill uh, where there was a former building. So that was in that 1992 picture, you saw a building. So that was all up in this area. But what you can see is this is all asphalt. It's kind of debris piles now, but on this right-hand side of it is an area where it was just artificially created when they created this asphalt area. Um, again, it was kind of hard to see here with the vegetation, but there are slopes on the left-hand side here where they created those slopes. And here's a perfect example. They cut in the road or the driveway going up to where those um, two buildings that were demolished were located. Um, but adjacent to that, there's a flat area and they cut it down. And if you start looking, and I'll go back to the overall map, if you start looking at where they've really created the man-made slopes, um, one of the intents of the code is, is that you don't disturb the wooded areas. And um, as all of you know from our previous presentations, this whole plan has been designed to preserve uh, those wooded areas up top. You have some 
a tree here and there, but you really, the slopes aren't in the wooded areas. They're around structures and parking. And here's the parking lot is this is just a very consistent grade going all the way down uh, where they cut in this parking lot. So you have steps down to the parking lot. It cut into the grade. And then the following picture rotates around 90 degrees. So Radnor Street Road's off to the left. But again, you can see they just cut in this whole corner um, to provide a level parking area. And then we get into all of the, the house pictures that we talked about. So going back to this image, so we went around, these were the two buildings that we talked about. That was the asphalt turnaround where you saw the pictures and kind of the slopes just adjacent to that. These were the steps um, with the driveway that went up past those houses. And then down below is the parking lot where you really get this man-made set of slopes that, that went through and kind of bisects the entire property. But I'd be happy to go through more detail with you or if you have questions or additional questions of what you see. So Rob, what, if, if you can't get relief from the steep slope issue, what happens to this project? This, this project um, may come in a different form um, and it may come entirely into a different type of project. Okay. And, and, and the steep slopes that you're going to need to address are about what percentage of the property? I don't have that exact percentage, but I can, I'll make sure I get that before the zoning meeting. Yeah, I'm calling it, I think it's under well under 5%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that would be what it looks like to me. I don't know how other people feel, but it seems like a, a small part of the project uh, footprint. Right, and as you can see the whole, so up along Eagle Road and coming a little bit down Radnor Street Road are the area that we were really trying to preserve that tall tree canopy. Right. And so if you had to preserve kind of the unnatural part of the center, it's going to push the development into those areas that we're trying to preserve. Matt, it's Dave. So one of the things I think that kind of seeing this application at this point in the process, one of the benefits I think for the township and for the residents is you see, you've already seen what the project looks like as we propose it coming through the land development phase. So you see what the ultimate outcome is. You, you see what this application is ultimately trying to achieve. But I think just to make sure kind of we're super clear, the project as we brought it through dies if there's no relief for steep slopes. Um, our entrance comes in and basically hits almost an immediate steep slope and then any access kind of right or left from that point. So the work we've done to line up the roads and create the access point um, basically goes away because you couldn't access the site at that point and then go, go to either side of the property. I guess it's north and south. You would, going south on the property would immediately cross slopes. So, and if you remember the, the plan as we're proposing it, that entrance drive comes in to a cul-de-sac and access is taken to the right off, off of that entrance drive. So the project as we see it certainly dies. And I think any reasonable use of the property is extremely compromised if we have to avoid slopes in their entirety just because of their sporadic location and ultimately the, the goals of the ordinance, which are to kind of control that ENS and then as well be mindful of the surrounding vegetation. So I just want to make sure that that we're clear. We definitely did go through and look to see if, if there was a way to do this and not disturb these slopes and keep this project moving. And ultimately, we found that that was not possible. And as a result, we submitted our application. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, having been on the site, I mean, it's, it was, I'm no engineer, but it, it seemed obvious to me that or especially around the parking lot, these were man-made slopes. Um, 
I, I have a couple of staff questions, but before that, um, I, just, I have a quick question. Um, and th this relief on the on these uh, slopes is required regardless of what where this ends up in terms of R1, R1A, R2, is that correct? That's that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I was I was I do have some uh, I do want to ask Roger and Steve some a uh, couple of questions, but before that, are, is there any other any commissioner comment at this point? Um, Roger, how do you feel about like this the this issue? Um, I mean, where where where's your head on this? You know, it, it looks to me like man-made uh, steep slopes here. Uh, I, I, I agree that they, you know, I've, I've looked at the site and reviewed the plans with Mr. Lambert, and I agree that they were created under man-made slopes. And I believe, I believe uh, Mr. Falcone made the point that had, had this been constructed in 2000, it would be permitted and there wouldn't be any issues with, with these slopes at this point. Okay. <laughs> Steve, uh, you, What's your take on this? Mr. Golis, I concur with the applicant's engineer. Uh, after I visited the site, I've seen it for many years aside from that. Uh, the slopes are very, very consistent. The distance between the contour lines is very consistent. Um, the grading at the split levels, that's very typical of what you would do. There's a, you know, it's a flat spot in front of the door. It drops down to a garage and a rear door. Uh, I concur that these would be man-made slopes. So it, it appears to me that we should recommend that the zoning hearing board approve this waiver, this, this hardship. Um, does anyone want to make a motion thusly? Well, I'll, Matt, I'll, I'll make Thanks, a motion uh, that we uh, fully support the disturbance of these uh, man-made steep slopes on this property. Uh, okay. Do we, have a, do we have a second? A second. All in favor? Wait, before you vote, before you vote. I'm sorry. Public comment. Public, right? That's right. Sorry. Thanks, Mayor. Trish, we have public comment. Ian, do we have any public comment? Uh, yes, I see one hand raised for uh, Barbara Blackney. Yes, hi, thank you. Can you hi, hear Barbara. Yep. Um, thank you. And um, I, I just have a couple comments and then perhaps some history on where the Planning Commission has stood in the past on the issue of steep slopes. Um, I do want to just express some dismay that um, the Planning Commission would be ready to move forward. In two years, neither Prime Minister, Netanyahu, or his various opponents have been able to build. What is that? Sorry, that's not me, <laughs> but I'm hearing that on there. Um, you know, without hearing public comment first um, and the benefit of knowledge that neighbors that have lived right, you know, within this a uh, parcel of land for 20 plus years might be able to, to shed. Um, I do, you know, agree that it appears that the slope right around the parking lot certainly appears to be man-made, but if you walk by uh, or spend any time kind of from afar viewing that entire site, the whole uh, site is basically a slope. Um, you know, so some of the other uh, hill and, you know, if you approach our neighborhood of North Wayne coming from Lancaster Avenue via Shimoni Road, you're definitely, you know, headed down a hill towards a valley, which is more or less that creek that runs right adjacent to this site and then back uphill. So I would urge you to, con to consider that really that whole topo topography there, if you view the neighboring property the Merino property, it's quite hilly. Um, the whole site is really slopes. Um, 
and I'm not sure that it's evident well documented that the uh, hills that you see adjacent to the houses, you know, are man-made. I think there's quite spurious evidence to that. Um, and certainly would be a reason to build split level houses, in my opinion, or walk out basements. But um, my husband served on the planning commission from 2004 to 2007. So I have great appreciation for all the time you all put in uh, and the volunteer duty and the responsibility of that. I became a bit of a you know planning commission fan during that time, plus I cared deeply about land conservation, historic preservation related issues. So I watched many, many meetings uh, during that time and over the years since then. I do remember that uh, there was discussion many, many times about steep slope. So I did a little digging through searching actually on the township website um, and have limited time just like all of you, but I do realize one of the, um, you know, the upsides of public service is term limits. You do your time, your duty, and then we move on to new people and fresh point of views. But one of the downsides of that is lack of continuity of knowledge sometimes. So I wanted to read to you this excerpt from the minutes of a meeting of December 5th, 2005. And very likely there's reference to this since then. I just haven't had the time to, to look for all of that. But this is brief, I promise you, but it's a discussion regarding the amendment of subdivision and zoning codes definition of steep slope and amendment to the definition of lot area in the subdivision code. And I'll skip the bit about lot area because it's not immediately relevant tonight. But here's the excerpt I would like to read. With respect to the steep slope issue, wording needs to be changed to clarify the issue that the township doesn't care how the slope got there in the first place, i.e. natural or man-made. Even though several members of the planning commission are not comfortable with that language, that is the ultimate goal of the ordinance to state that there is no difference. John Simon suggested that this change apply to subdivision applications only, thereby not affecting the single homeowner who wishes to put an addition on his home or construct an accessory building on his property. Again, Mr. Simon reiterated the fact that they are seeking verbiage that makes no difference between a natural slip or one which was man-made many years ago. Although not specifically amended in either the subdivision or zoning code, it was determined that a steep slope is a steep slope and it shouldn't matter how it got there. And I do know from following meetings, both of the planning commission and, and the board of commissioners that that has been adhered to for many, many years. Um, so again, I thank you for your time. And that is my comment this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Ian, is, Trish, is there any other public comment? Uh, I am not seeing any more hand raise, hands raised from the public, no. So we were about to vote on uh, supporting the position of the developer as they go to zoning hearing board. Uh, all who approve, raise their hand, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Trish, I think we're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, next up is 200 South Ithan Avenue. It's a preliminary land development plan. Um, Nick, are you on this? I am. How are you? Good, good, Matt, thank you. Um, you've seen this before. Uh, you saw both in preliminary plan. Uh, you saw as prior to the Board of Commissioners getting it for a recommendation for the conditional use. Um, the only thing that's changed since the last time you saw this is that the conditional use uh, application of the applicant was approved by the Board of Commissioners. Uh, there was a significant condition in that use approval, and that was a construction of a 
five foot sidewalk along South Ithan on the eastern side of South Ithan, connecting Agnes Irwin uh, all the way down to uh, Metalwood Road. Uh, that was a condition of the approval. Basically the approval condition reads that um, the applicant will construct uh, those sidewalks if the township's able to get the easements that are required outside of the public right of way. And if they're unable to get those easements, then the applicant would contribute. Um, I apologize. That's my old lab barking at probably a squirrel. Um, so uh, part of the approval was that, um, that if that, if, they're, if the township's unable to get those right of way approvals, that the applicant would actually contribute the cost of those sidewalks to the township sidewalk fund. Um, that kind of leads to one of the waivers that we're requesting here uh, this evening, and that is regarding the sidewalks interior to development itself. Um, I believe all the discussions we've had with both planning and the board of commissioners, whether it was always assumed that would be in lieu of sidewalks uh, within the cul-de-sac development itself, since the applicant would be spending a significant amount of money installing those sidewalks along South Ithan, that most uh, people and both boards seem to agree uh, was a good idea. Um, just to review, uh, this subdivision, this nine lot subdivision was part of a approved density modification plan for the development of 30 acres. This is for 6.9 acres uh, of that uh, 38 acres. There was a previous uh, main mansion there that was that burned down several years ago. Since that time, the property has been distressed. Uh, it was purchased by GPX in February of this year. Uh, they went to the Homeowners Association. The Homeowners Association unanimously approved that they liked this development, in particular the fact that uh, of the cul-de-sac uh, development on it. Um, as I said, since you've seen the plan, nothing has changed outside of the installation of sidewalks on South Ithan. You have those plans for the installation of the sidewalks along South Ithan before you as well. It's already been engineered and laid out um, and submitted to the township. Uh, if you wish, I, we basically have resolved all the issues in the review letters except for a couple. The rev last review letters we had were in October. You recently in March received um, comments from our engineer shock group regarding those comments. And I believe really remaining, there's only a couple outstanding issues remaining. Um, we're asking for two waivers. One is a traditional waiver that pretty much everyone asks for regarding uh, items within 500 feet of development. We have provided an aerial that basically serves the same use of that and the same need of that, indicating all the monuments within 500 feet. And the other waiver where we are requesting is sidewalks within the cul-de-sac itself, within the development itself. Um, as I mentioned, we are installing the sidewalks along South Ithan. Um, there are a couple comments in the review letters that I can uh, kind of hit on. I believe there's only maybe three of them that have not really been resolved here. Um, all of the zoning issues raised by Roger in the Gannett Fleming review letter that should have been resolved by the density modification conditional use approval by the Board of Commissioners. Nick, as, as you're going through those items, can um, the Planning Commission have the benefit of, of hearing from Roger to see if he agrees that all the zoning issues have been resolved either by the approval of the conditional use application or by other means? Sure. Yeah, just um, at first, I just want to say we just received these plans a little over a week ago and haven't had time to really dig through all of them. Uh, but has, as Nick had said, that uh, their engineer had gone through and, and provided responses to each comment. And that letter is in your packet tonight. Uh, and I agree that the zoning issues have now been taken care of uh, through the, the uh, conditional use approval.
basically the other issues, um, it, you know, are compliance issues, you know, and obviously Roger and the engineer will have, have to review them to make certain they are in compliance, but, you know, our response to all of them w is basically a will comply. And as I said, the plans have been updated to indicate uh, compliance with those issues. Um, the, the remaining issues um, that, that I see were the two waiver requests that I mentioned. And then um, I believe that really is the two issues from uh, Damon's letter um, from Gilmore. And again, I believe we're in compliance with, in, with the code on that. Uh, we, we, we have revised the subdivision to uh, comply with a number of the items. Uh, you may recall there was an issue regarding the cul-de-sac radius that's been um, revised and complied with. There was an issue um, regarding- I'm, I'm sorry, Nick, I, and I'm interrupting you again. And I do apologize. Sorry, Go ahead, yeah. Um, we don't have review letters for the new plans. They were just submitted a week ago. I don't believe so, outside of- Yeah, that's um, correct. We have a letter from Shock, which basically says that we will comply and have complied with all of those items. But 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 our our engineers haven't had time to review the plans and issue review letters. Correct. We rely on Correct. staff very much. Correct. And uh, if they haven't had a chance to handle this uh, in the appropriate way, it struck me, uh, Nick. Uh, hi, it's Skip. Uh, nice. A few things that are in the reply letter that says they're placeholders, as opposed to final. Uh, proposals. Uh, do you think it's really appropriate to, I guess you do, but to go for preliminary approval tonight with those uh, openings in the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Skip, I think one of the items was like lighting, and that's where they mentioned the placeholders request, and that's really a, a final plan item. I mean, the preliminary plan shows where lighting would be um, and indicating, but of course, a lighting plan would all be subject to final plan approval. We're just here this evening on preliminary but, plan. But Nick, there was, there's also, there are, there are stormwater placeholders as well. Like there, there are nine place, at least nine or 10 placeholders, which I don't know how, if I'm Roger, like I, I I'm, I, I'm going to be worried about that because, you know, we don't know what, what we're dealing with here. Like, it, it seems like um, there's a ten, it seems like there's a tendency in my four years on planning that, you know, there's, this, there's a lot of will comply and I understand that. But I think for preliminary approval, I'd like to see the details. I really would, I, I don't Matt, wanna Matt, see- this is this is Roger. Uh, some of the details that Nick is referring to with the final stormwater design and the lighting design is a requirement of final plan approval, not preliminary plan approval. Upon preliminary, you just need to show that you can comply with these ordinances. The final nuts and bolts details are part of the final plan. So that the stormwater design typically is all finalized at the final plan stage. And they'll be back in front of you at some time in the future for final plan approval. I guess. So, Ro Roger, in general, you're you're are you comfortable with um, are you comfortable with us moving ahead on approval with this much detail left out of this uh, plan, I, or am I just? Missing? Yeah, I, I I I don't have any objections over this. Uh, as as Nick mentioned, some of the stuff uh, is is relatively minor details, um, and again, with the with the stormwater. That's final plan approval. And then after final plan approval, during the grading permit stage at construction, there's another bite at the apple there for stormwater, where then they have to comply once again at the grading permit process. So the stormwater, we have a lot of time to get that finalized. Uh, and should they not be able to meet one of those ordinances when we get into the details, then, then they're back in front of you because they have to comply with the ordinance. So I, I just like to, to ch chime in here and I fully understand what Roger's saying. Um, and that's fine. But I, I do agree with Matt in that uh, it's been talked about 
for some time by the planning commission that they'd like to see plans somewhat more complete and some of the storm order requirements and i'm, I'm not uh going against what roger said i fully understand and, and there's no problem with what he's saying but like item five um please revise the storm order report to include all applicable case all applicable calculations were a couple of the pro areas. Uh, please provide infiltration testing results, including a death to limiting zone. And they say that'll be part of the final plans. If for some reason there's infiltration, if the site fails our infiltration requirements, they're gonna have to go to the board and request a waiver for that portion or whatever portion of the stormwater management uh, needs to be done. And that's a that's a sizable issue, right? And I think that's something that should be um, drawn out on the preliminary plan. Uh, any revisions to size of location or individual structures will be addressed at this time. Profiles over utilities and Rogers correct. The some of these are just details, uh, but nonetheless, I you know I think. The planning commission should have as clean a possible plan at a at preliminary approval in that you want it should just be outside agency and you know other items like that between preliminary and final. Uh, lastly, I think the planning commission should know that they or should espouse on the fact that they're requesting a waiver for interior sidewalks. And what they're noting in there is, hey, we're requesting a waiver, but by the way, we're, we're gonna install, or we've been told we have to install these sidewalks on the other side of the street. Really, these two are, these are two very different items, right? The conditional use hearing, the board required them to install sidewalks on the Eastern side of South Lathan Avenue. There was no quid pro quo for sidewalks on the eastern side of South Ithan Avenue and what's required in the development and along Ithan Avenue as part of that development. That's why they're, they're requesting a waiver. So I would like also the planning commission to pose to the planning commission, what are you, your thoughts on that waiver request? That's, to me, that's a sizable waiver request. They're, they're playing it against what they're required to do, but they are asking to say, to not install any sidewalks in the development. First, just why, why are they asking not to install sidewalks? What's the, the specific reason? Is it an aesthetic or is it merely a cost or what? Well, Skip, to be perfectly honest, from the very beginning, when we talked about this and the township approached us about sidewalks on South Ithan, it was always discussed as in lieu of. Now, I agree that um, the Board of Commissioners put a condition on that evening, but I found out when I saw the resolution about five minutes before the conditional use hearing. Um, and, um, you know, even when we I believe when we met with the planning commission previously, we also talked about we'd be willing to install sidewalks on South Ithan, but always talked about being in lieu of sidewalks in the cul-de-sac. Our belief here is on these type of homes, these estate, estate manor type homes, the residents really don't want sidewalks. I mean, we have a cul-de-sac, very limited traffic. Um, the residents would rather have more lawn area, more front yard than sidewalks that they would have to maintain. Um, you know, particularly since it's a cul-de-sac with nine homes on it with very limited traffic on it. Um, as to the stormwater issue, uh, the, the code provides that stormwater is a final plan um, issue. You know, it's not a preliminary plan issue. Nick, if, if I can uh, jump in there, we did submit uh, we did submit a, a narrative explaining the stormwater uh, design and the feasibility as part of the preliminary and as roger said you know all the details calculations uh 
and, and things like that to go into this are final plan requirements. They're not preliminary plan requirements. So all that being said, and you know, I, I wanna let everybody know, we've had town hall, we had a town hall meeting on the proposed sidewalk on the east side of South Ithan. Developer has spent time talking to the residents. Uh, this project has been before everybody. So I, I don't wanna take anything away from the, develop, the developers and his team's due diligence in bringing this project forward and bringing it to light. There's, there's nothing about that. But I, I, I'll throw this to the Planning Commission and I'll give you my opinion. So we got a revised set of plans and the uh, applicant's engineer responded to each comment. And I don't doubt, and Roger had noted that the zoning, that's fine, it was all taken care of. Uh, but from my standpoint, I would like to have our consultants and staff do the final review and it may be minimal on what was submitted late, but I, I'd rather come back to the planning commission with our consultants and staff saying, yes, here we are, right? But we got plans late, they're not fully reviewed. You don't have review letters, so. I, I second what Steve said, um, if you're looking for input from staff. I, under, I understand Roger's position, but regardless of whether either the ordinance or tradition provides in Radnor, state law says you're entitled to final plan approval in accordance with your preliminary plan approval. And if, I think it's very awkward to uh, give preliminary approval to a plan when you're not sure if infiltration stormwater BMPs are going to actually infiltrate because it could require a change in the stormwater management system that affects lot layout. So, um, my recommendation would be wait till your engineers have a chance to issue review letters so you have the benefit of professional expertise in the review of the plans. I, Mary, uh, I feel that I, 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 like, I, like, the, I like this development. I, I think the neighbors want it, but I just feel awkward right now. Like I, I don't feel like I'm ready to approve something where it just seems like it's uh, not complete. I mean, this application is not complete. And I'd like to know how some other commissioners feel about it. Well, I think I've already spoken that I'm uh, concerned that there's so many placeholders and I didn't realize the depth of the stormwater issue. So I'm sort of in agreement with you, Matt. Yeah, I, I feel similarly after hearing, you know, the staff and, and the fact they want more time Any other commissioner I, com comment here? Matt, I do as well, especially after hearing Mary's comment. I, I agree with all the other uh, board members. My question I have is that what's the downside for the developer to go back, look at the plans, readjust, redo their calculations and come back to the board? Can they come back next month? What's the downside? They could yeah, definitely I, come back next month. That would be up to them how quickly, uh, if we have new comments. I mean, Roger will be able to have review letters out before the next PC meeting. Uh, Mr. Cornelia may have to provide an additional extension while this occurs. I'd have to look back at the sheet, but Nick may have to give us an extension. Uh, and then if all is well at the next planning commission meeting, they would be before the board. It's, I would have them on the schedule, on the agenda to be before the board of commissioners uh, directly thereafter. So can, can, can we also review right now? Um, in my mind, there's two different things going on. You have the planning, the, the plants calculations and stormwater, then also you have the sidewalk issue. I'm hoping that the planning commission will opine on that. I mean, that's, that's yeah. a waiver request. It's going to go to the board and it's the board of commissioners decision, but, uh, and Mr. Cornelia laid out the reasons why the developer doesn't feel uh, they, they would be required. But again, understand, aside from what Mr. Cornelia had said that all along, you know, we said we'd do one without the other, a waiver is still required if they don't want to put the sidewalks in the development, right? There, like I said, there was no quid pro quo. 
Um, so they're going to have to go to the board. I'm asking the planning commission to give some opinion on that so I can include that uh, when this gets wrapped up and goes to the board. Can I, can I just ask a quick question? What is the width of the cul-de-sac right now? The cartway, the cartway width is 28 feet. What's the stand, forgive me for asking this question, I should know this answer, but in a standard residential street in Radnor, what's the standard width? 28 feet. I think when we last dealt with the sidewalk issue, we were, as a commission, we were pretty um, firm about how important sidewalks were on Ithan because people walked their dogs, they had kids in strollers on that road, people are going 40 miles an hour. It's not good, it's not a good situation. Um, if, if that's a trade-off, I, I mean, personally, I feel like the interior sidewalks are less important for safety reasons than the Ithan sidewalk. Um, so Matt, just one thing to remember, it's not a trade-off, it's still the, and Whatever the Planning Commission's recommendation, the Planning Commission may say we support the waiver to uh, on sidewalks. It's going to go to the board, but the way the conditional use was written, it doesn't give them a break on the interior sidewalks. It just says you have to install these. They have to go for a waiver if they don't want to put them in. I I just I personally think that aesthetically and as well as if you're going to have a non another layer of non-permeable area, particularly on a downward sloping street, I, I just don't see the, the, personally, I just don't see the need for having any interior sidewalks on a cul-de-sac. You know, having lived on a street for 38 years and recently moved, but um, we had no sidewalks on Atley Road and uh, the cartway was even narrower and I, I guess I was grateful that we didn't have sidewalks in a weird way. I, I think it uh, had a more country feel. Yeah. Uh, Skip, we walk that, as you know, at Lee all the time, and it's a great country feel the way it is without the sidewalks. I think it would really destroy the feel on at Lee if you had sidewalks. And I think similarly, you know, this will be the same way. Does the surrounding streets that this is sort of being nestled into, are there sidewalks there? And so the, the Old Oaks neighborhood, um, no, you know, Meadowood, no, there's not sidewalks on, to the best of my knowledge, Browning Lane, Meadowood, or, or those areas. Or Trianon. Or Trianon, that is correct, sir. So my goal was to get some type of response from the Planning Commission on the sidewalks whether you support the waiver or you don't. And, I, and impervious surface isn't something to worry about because they would have to cover that in their stormwater management. So th it, that you don't have to worry about, but whether you, the aesthetics of the sidewalk or for whatever reason, I would just like to hear the planning commission's thoughts on this. So the board has some information from you. Mr. Chairman, if it, it bears noting that um, Liz Springer is trying to get into the meeting right now. So you might want to make her part of the conversation. Is she on, Mary? I No, we're, uh, Ian's going to have to send her the link. We I can't give her my link because then she's going to come up as Steve Norsini. So uh, okay. for, I have a sense. Uh, well, well, excuse me, is, is Sarah early because I send her my link. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Mary, um, is, is there a technical reason you can't build the sidewalks? Uh, not that I'm not aware of, Dave Fiorello. No, no. So I know you, so know, you I just know, don't you just don't want to? Well, just to let the board know, the sidewalks along Ithan or probably three times the expense of the sidewalks in the cul-de-sac. Now, I know people don't wanna hear about expense, but you know, again, the way we discussed this, I mean, we said if the township wants the sidewalks on South Ith and um, we'd be willing to do it, but we, we always discussed it in the board. 
But the, 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 not required. What, whatever the planning commission thinks is in the best interests of the neighborhood vis-a-vis -vis sidewalks, interior, yeah. interior. Sure. That's what's going to um, rule the day. But I'll, I'll just take a little bit of an issue with Nick's recollection of, of the history of this. There was a lot of discussion the first time this plan came in front of you um, by people who felt it was really important to have sidewalks on the train on side of Life Avenue. Thinks is in the best interest. Okay. Yeah, she, she's logged on as me. Thanks, Liz. And um, um, and the discussion, and, and John Rice and I spoke of this often, was whether to require sidewalks along the Ithan Avenue frontage when the Homeowners Association wanted nothing to do with them and how to handle the issue of sidewalks on Ithan, given that the Homeowners Association wouldn't accept responsibility for them. And I think that this was the alternative to that. That doesn't mean you can't grant a waiver for the interior sidewalks, but I, I don't recall it being uh, um, of an in lieu of situation. And I have to concur with the solicitor. It is not an in lieu of situation. I know that's what Nick's inferring. If it was an in lieu of situation, that would have been part of the conditional use hearing. But the commissioners, whether they approve the waiver or not, is immaterial. But as part of land development, they're required to put sidewalks. If they don't want to install the sidewalks for the reason Mr. Cornelia and Mr. Conwell noted, they need to request a waiver. Yeah, and we are I, requesting the waiver. I mean, we right. understand this. And, and, right. and I, I just wanted to get some feel for the planning commission so we can provide that to the board of commissioners uh, when this plan goes to the board. The I have to, just to make this clear, it, there's no technical reason not to have the sidewalks. So why don't you want to have the sidewalks just because you don't want to build them? Um, hey, Nick, maybe I, I could answer this. St um, uh, Stephen, th this is Joe Conwell. I'm, I'm with the developer. Um, first, we don't think that the buyers want sidewalks in in this in this type of a home, and so for that reason, I mean, that's you know selfishly, that's where our our interest is in is is trying to create a product that the, that the buyers want the most. Secondly, um, although I know that um, cost is 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 kind of our problem, um, it it is the, uh, the Putting the sidewalks on Ithan Avenue is just south of three times the cost of putting sidewalks in, and so, it, it, although it's not popular, cost is is a, is I think a, a reasonable consideration. And secondly, with due res, all due respect to every to the, the varying um, opinions on on whether or not you know what the prior discussions were, I have been involved in all of them. And some of them have been in public meetings, and some of them have not. Um, and they all have uh, included the concept of rather than you know that the Ithan Avenue uh, it, sidewalks would be a safety issue and is a big priority for the residents of the community. And so we would you know we we may want to consider having having you as part of your project put sidewalks on Ithan Avenue. Um, and, it, it, and I don't know exactly what, I don't want to quote anybody, but the concept was pretty consistently, maybe not in every single conversation, but pretty consistently was, you know, in lieu of putting them in the, uh, rather than putting them in the cul-de-sac. And so that, that's really the reason. There's, no, there's not a technical reason, but that is what we always understood the discussion to be. We actually made a written proposal to the township, um, you, you know, clearly uh, stating that we were we would you know be happy to make it a certain you know it was actually at that time it was a a, a certain amount of money that we we offered uh, because that's what we thought it was going to take to um, to build them. <clears throat> So I just want to be clear, and, and absolutely, I absolutely acknowledge that there is no quid pro quo in the Board of Commissioners conditional use approval. Um, and, and don't dispute that at all, but I, I do feel that we are within reason requesting this, this, this waiver. And I, and I 
you know, wanted to address your question, which is a reasonable one, Stephen, that you had to ask twice. Is there a technical reason? And um, I'd like to just ask a quick question here, and I apologize for joining in later, but my work meeting went over. Um, I live, I back up to South, South Eithen Avenue to this neighborhood that you're building. So I apologize if I've missed a prior conversation before joining in, but we've been asking for sidewalks on Eithen for years. Right. So who, who are you speaking to in our neighborhood that's telling you that we don't want them? No, no, no we're not, we never said that. We're not. We, 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 no, we never we're said that. So, I have on the screen a plan to put uh, all the sidewalks on on I, on. I okay, I just want to make sure. I mean, what you do, in, from my personal opinion, you know, if you're in a cul-de-sac community and you're trying to preserve a certain community feel and, and you as a neighborhood want to do something a little different within that community, that could be one thing. But I, I strongly feel that, I mean, literally, you can't look anywhere but on the road when driving on site out than right now. I do it multiple times a day. And it is not if someone's going to get hit, it's when they get hit. It's going to happen. Yeah, we have we've just, we, we have been, we have fully designed sidewalks for the east side okay. of Eithen Avenue. Go okay, I just screen. want to make sure that that's not what the waiver's for. I apologize, I missed your earlier conversation, but I have problems logging in with the YouTube thing. Yeah. So. Now the waiver's are only for the interior of the cul-de-sac. Gotcha. Okay. Are there any questions about the the Eithen Avenue sidewalks that we designed? Yeah, Joe, uh, it says four feet on the plan, and then I I, I swear I, I read five feet right, somewhere. Right, right. Well, it, it was, and you know, Dave Fiorello, can you explain why we're showing four foot sidewalks instead of five? Yes, uh, we're providing a, a minimum of a green space between the edge of the road and the sidewalk. And right now uh, we've got limited right of way uh, to fit a five foot sidewalk in. We can get a four foot sidewalk and stay within uh, the township right away, but there are certain portions along there that if we went the five feet, we'd be encroaching onto private property and would need uh, uh, an easement or whatever from the property owners. Uh, so we're proposing a four foot sidewalk along there to stay within um, the available right away. Mr. Golas, I, uh, so in reviewing, and again, these plans were reviewed uh, we did have Commissioner Borowski and Township Manager Bill White did host a town hall meeting with uh, the residents along that side of the road. So in speaking with a developer, I think it would be fair to ask, even though the conditional use required five foot, for the reasons Mr. Fiorello mentioned, uh, if this moves forward, to request the board that they they go with the four foot for all the reasons Mr. Fiorello stated. Um, going five foot and bringing them back further would require easements all along the sidewalk or at least in many places. So this might be a happy medium should these be built. I'll just note very quickly, if you do do four foot sidewalks, you will need a five foot by five foot section every 200 feet to meet the ADA requirements. I don't know how that will impact any easements that you may um, that may be required. Thank you, Damon. And I did let the developer know. I think that's something that's upcoming. And uh, Mr. Drummond does have a copy of this, but this is is concept level. So as the developer uh, provides more detailed plans for this, Mr. Drummond and Gilmore Associates will be reviewing it, as will staff, and then we'll meet with the residents again. Uh, to give them a better idea of what, what is being proposed. So, hey, um, Go ahead. Pardon me. Um, so I'm, I'm a little puzzled. I'm looking at the packet of drawings and the cul-de-sac shows sidewalks. Uh, do you have the latest packet, Stephen? Uh, I know we what, submitted the advice plan. I'm looking at Gannett Flaming's uh, download. So perhaps if you have another plan, please please show it to me. I think uh, Joe has it up on the screen. Yeah, here, here okay, is so, the, right. the development plan. <clears throat> okay. 
So even if you put sidewalks in here, other than walking within your own nine house community, they really don't go anywhere, do they? Uh, no. Uh, my question is, is that what's the practicality of the sidewalk in the first place on a cul-de-sac with just nine homes? I mean, I, I, I just don't see the, I just see, don't see the point period of, of having uh, sidewalks there. And I agree with, uh, you know, just listening to Nick and, and listening to, uh, to Mr. Conwell about it's not quid pro quo. And I, you know, that, that aside, I just don't see the need for that. And listen, from a, you know, quid pro quo or not quid pro quo, from a practical standpoint, if they could use the money to further really benefit South Lathan Avenue, whereas uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, clearly explained, which I completely agree with her, driving down the road all the time, you, that's where you need the sidewalks. So in my mind, it's this is pretty clear. I think so there are two, two things, Mr. Golas. Um, uh, Skip, will you, you have something to say? I'm just gonna say there are two issues that we were trying to develop here. One is our attitude towards the interior cul-de-sac sidewalks, which maybe we should have an independent vote just on that issue. And the second is, and the bigger issue is uh, a vote on whether or not uh, we should defer preliminary uh, approval or rejection Correct. on additional data points that we don't have and review letters that we don't have. Correct. Yeah, and, and just, you know, and Joe confirm this, I uh, have not spoken to Joe about this, Joe Conwell. Um, I, I understand, and, and I think I uh, read the mood of the board regarding proceeding further on this uh, this evening as far as um, um, a continuance um, or a tabling of the overall plan. I understand that. And if the board does decide to table the plan, we will give necessary extension because right now I think we're <coughs> Called May 4th or May 5th. So certainly I would extend it for another month to um, early June, whenever that would be. So Nick, the, the next planning commission is May 3rd. So the assumption is if, and I'm not speaking for the commission, if they did table this or held this, uh, you would be placed on the May 3rd agenda. Okay. And I would extend it um, through June. Do we have two board of commissioners meetings in May? Steve, do you know? Yes, we do. Okay, I'll make certain at least that I extend it beyond two board of commissioners meetings. The next two board of commissioners meetings after May 3rd, which is probably sometime in June. So in May, we have one on May 10th, board of commissioners, and May 24th, board of commissioners. Okay, I'll extend it to June 3rd or June 4th, as I said, 30 days after um, whatever the current extension is to, I think it's May 5th. Well, so can I, can I just, I'll just finish my point. I really applaud uh, you putting sidewalks on Ithan. I, I think that's having dropped my daughter off for years at Agnes Irwin, I'm well aware of the traffic along Ithan. It's not nice. And then regarding the sidewalks on a cul-de-sac street, um, I'm kind of okay. I mean, it's, it's going to be up to your nine house owners, uh, whether they you know, like a community with or without sidewalks. I, I, I think it's gonna, um, if, it was a, if it was a street, a city street, a uh, Radnor street that passed through and went on to uh, another block and uh, then I wouldn't support that. But I think in a cul-de-sac, it is kind of questionable whether it's necessary. And even if you have them, they don't go anywhere, so. So that, that's kind of my, my position on it. So, so Mr. Chairman, um, are we at a point where we can address the sidewalk issue separately and then uh, address the tabling or not of, of this preliminary application? Yeah, I mean, the sidewalk issue is a recommendation if I understand Steve. Um, and so we can, we, can, we, we can call a vote right now on do we need public comment first? Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, you're right. Yep. <laughs> Ian, is there any public comment? 
Uh, I am not seeing any hands raised for public comment. Okay. So, um, does somebody want to put forth a motion to rec uh, to recommend to the board of commissioners that we uh, grant a waiver? We make a motion that we uh, grant the waiver sought for the interior sidewalks of the development. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Trish, you got that? So that's unanimous? That was unanimous. Yes. Okay, thank you. And with Liz, that's 6-0. Is Liz still there as Mary? Yes, Ms. Ms. Eberly, the second is there. Thank you. <laughs> so um, is I think we, I, from what I've heard from the board, I mean, it seems like everyone agrees that we should table this um, table approval of the preliminary plan until we have sufficient detail to feel comfortable doing that. Um, Someone want to put forth a motion? I make a I make a motion that we table this application for preliminary approval for another meeting for next month. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Steve, one quick question, um, Mary, would we have to send out new notices if we already agreed that the next hearing would be May 3rd. I'm gonna let Steve answer that. Uh, Nick, I, I think you do, uh, but I will check to see if it's absolutely required or okay. if it's just a staff call. The if it's a staff call, I'm gonna tell you, yes, you need to send them out. Uh, Mr. Conwell has been very upfront with this project and he's met with everybody and I, and I commend him on what he's been doing. Um, and I just wanna keep that level of transparency and, and actually notification moving forward. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you all. And Dave. Okay, next up is uh, 250 King of Pressure Road zoning hearing board application. Just to remind everyone, we, we heard last month, we heard uh, this project, uh, we received the, the they were, uh, they were be be before us for the zoning hearing board application, but they've uh, done some revisions to the application. So I think um, Bob Tucker. Yes, th thank you, Matt. Uh, Bob Tucker uh, representing the applicant, uh, again, being the owner of the property at 250 King of Pressure Road. Uh, with me this evening is <clears throat> uh, Joe Trainer and uh, our engineer, Alex Tweedy. Um, and as Matt indicated, we were here last month uh, where the Planning Commission voted to uh, take a neutral position with regard to the um, pending zoning variance application. Um, we're, we're back here tonight to go through the, the changes we made to the applicant's plan following feedback from the Board of Commissioners um, at their meeting last night. Uh, accordingly, we, we continued the zoning hearing to April 15th. Uh, again, Joe and Alex are here and they're gonna walk you through the changes that were made in the plan. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Bob. Thank you everyone for your time tonight. So I'm Joe Trainer with Brandywine. Uh, at Matt, as you mentioned, um, this is the application that we presented to you last month with some amendments to it. We, we amended the application based on feedback from the Board of Commissioners with their feedback in mind. Uh, we're still seeking three variants requested, but in a moment, I'll turn it over to Alex Tweedy from Landcore Engineering to walk through 
the changes, uh, really the biggest change is we're looking to minimize the variance request asset as much as possible on minimum landscape area. So our prior application, and, and Alex will be able to quote the exact numbers, we were asking for a variance on minimum landscape area, and it was over 12,000 square feet. We've reduced it now to 7,000 square feet, nearly a 5,000 square foot reduction. And in doing so, we, we did have to sacrifice some of the added parking spaces. So the rest of the plan is relatively the same, uh, still proposing a structured parking deck that goes two tiers above grade. We didn't want to go to a third level because then the project then becomes a very large parking garage and really overpowers the site. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alex to really walk through the changes. Thank you, Joe. Um, I am sharing my screen to show the proposed um, site plan that was submitted with the modifications. As noted, the result or the reason for the changes was feedback from the Board of Commissioners on impervious coverage or inversely the minimum landscape area. The general layout of the site and everything we discussed last month is still um, very much applicable. Parking garage is still in the same location. As Joe noted, still the same size and, and number of stories. The majority of the changes occurred at the main entrance in the existing parking field and then some minor modifications to the southwest where we were proposing some additional um, generator pads. The best view might be this comparison drawing, which this is the original zoning plan that you saw last month in red overlaid on top of the current zoning plan. So the bulk of the changes occurred at this main entrance. We agreed or proposed to, to remove some of the existing parking lot and maximize green space at this main entrance, which also allows us to install uh, a rain garden for some stormwater improvements as well. Like we said, the Parking garage is still the same. We were able to reduce the stair tower and elevator room slightly smaller, and we had a larger um, impervious plaza for the pedestrians to cross. We reduced that down to just a simple sidewalk and ADA ramp to get across to the main entrance. And then also, as we discussed, we originally were proposing two generator pads we've reduced that to one, which saves some existing green space in this area as well. As Joe noted that we were originally 539 total parking stalls. We reduced it by 10 to go down to 529. And from a minimum landscape area standpoint, we're now only increasing impervious by 7,327 whereas the previous was 12,270. So as we noted, we were able to find about 5,000 more square feet of green space. Um, just for recollection and summary, we noted there are three waivers that we are, or variances that we were going for in front of the zoning hearing board. Those relate to setbacks, which remain unchanged as we noted, the property line is a little bit unique. It doesn't follow the ring road. So there is a setback variance for the structure on the southern property line and the eastern property line. The southern property line is 43.39 feet opposite King of Prussia Road. And this property line is 17.17 feet opposite Radnor Chester Road. Those remain the same as they were last month. There's also a building and structure area variance that does not change as the size of the garage is the same. It's still 42.4% requesting a variance, but we were able to reduce the variance from the minimum landscaped area. We're now 29.4% where we were previously 27.8%. Um, That is the brief summary. If there's any additional questions, I can provide more clarity, but 
the general change was increasing the green space in this area by the main entrance. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, I think last month I mentioned that uh, this is the Penn Medicine Building, right? It is, yes. Correct, yes. It, it, it's always been underparked, and I think even after you build this, uh, it'll still be underparked, relatively speaking. Correct. From the code perspective, we are improving the existing nonconformity, but it will still be below the code standard for parking. But we believe substantially better than it is today. And then, Skip, just to clarify on that, the uh, what we've shown today is keeping the existing mix of uses between medical office and professional office. Um, we really where we see this building going as we go to retenant it. That's probably worst case scenario. I do see a, a larger mix of of office or lab as opposed to medical office, which is a uh, significantly lower parking load, especially in daily trips in and out throughout the day. So the the goal here and what we're proposing is to really get to um, over three per thousand parking ratio, which is is pretty uh, standard for the market. This is a terrific plan on having the parking garage. I think it's a great use of space and we've done these for a couple other places. Uh, is there a reason why you didn't want to put a third level on considering the view point? Like when you're coming around, you really can't see it because of all the trees and how it sits coming around that corner. Is there, I know you mentioned you were worried about the height of it, but is there a reason you can't put a third story on and give up more parking around the perimeter? It really, it was the height. Um, once you get, especially in a suburban, so this is two stories above grade. So it really is three stories at ground level, um, second level and third level going up to another tier in, uh, in suburban parking garages. It becomes a bit of a challenge and really those top, that top level starts to become a, a bit of unused space. And it does, it would then put this parking structure taller than the adjacent building structure where it then begins to really kind of stand out as the the largest structure on the property okay so you're saying that basically by the time you get to that height people don't want to go all the way up there to park so it becomes, it becomes unused yeah it becomes a challenge okay thank you along those lines do you have a side view that would show the comparative heights of the of the structure in the existing building Alex, are you pulling it up? This is the rendering from the architect that generally shows. So you can see we have ground level and then a stru structure level one, structure level two. It's generally in line with the top of the main portion of the building. As Joe noted, with a third level, we believe this upper level would start to peak above, above the main field, the main roof of the, the core building. And Alex, can you go to the, uh, the street view in this package as well? Yeah. So this will give you a good sense of it as well. Um, it's a little bit hard to see here uh, because it's behind the tree, but the, the elevator, elevator and stair tower um, that's really in line with the height of the existing building. If you add another tier, then that also has to go up with it. Sure. No, I, I understand. It's just helpful to have a better rather than the, the flat scale squares. And you also don't feel that it would be beneficial to you to have the extra height. It just wouldn't, it, you don't think it'd be worth the investment. It doesn't, it, it, um, as I mentioned, it becomes a challenge and really there's become um, seldom used parking spaces once you get too high in a suburban environment. Even if you were to connect it like Bryn Mawr Hospital Medical Arts Building did to the hospital where you have a skywalk? Uh, we admittedly haven't looked at that. I think that would, yeah, that would become, uh, you know, again, would probably become a very large structure and really was our goal was try to minimize the impact on the site as much as possible. It would then become a you know substantially larger structure, substantially larger project.
Just a uh, quick question. As far as entering the parking garage, are there multiple entrances from the service road? Alex, can you point those out there? there yeah, are. So from a, from a main circulation standpoint, and we discussed this last month as well, the main goal of siting the garage was to keep this main entrance and this loop existing. In the existing condition, there are multiple parking fields off this loop road. As you can see, you can enter all mm -hmm. these rows of parking. We are proposing to maintain those access points through this project. So we'll have the main entrance to the garage on the north face here. We are proposing three more connection points through those existing parking lots. The center one will be dual access in and out, but these other two will be exit only through the facility. Is there any other uh, commission comment? Is there any staff comment? Mr. Chairman, I just have a, a, a quick comment. There was some conversation about adding a, a third story on top. Uh, is it possible for them to recess the first level um, so it's slightly below grade, not maybe completely below grade, uh, and then put that third deck on top? That way it may be in line with the same roof, um, but still be able to get that additional parking. Um, I don't believe so. The, the ground level is the existing parking field itself at the conditions that it is today, where we're really just building the first and second structured levels above the existing parking field. So any ability, the, the elevations of the garage are basically dictated by the existing elevations of the parking lot today, plus the required clearances for vehicular traffic through the garage, et cetera. So the elevations are, are set by the existing grade of this drive aisle at the main entrance. Um, and then everything is, is basically controlled from there. So the elevations sure. well, are, could, are locked could in. Could have uh, kind of a two, elevate, two elevations or levels up and one elevation down um, mm -hmm. to be able to get four levels instead of just the three? If you have some ability there with the service road being slightly depressed to be able yeah. to get that lower level, maybe a little bit lower. That loop road should be a lower elevation than the entrance points. And that way they could take advantage of that um, and then possibly increase the numbers of levels on the, without encroaching into the overall height of the uh, existing building. Just a thought. Right. But if we lowered it to the elevation of the loop road, then this connection to the ramp for the upper levels wouldn't wouldn't align. It's not this route road isn't low enough to be an entire story below. So unless unless we got an entire story and we're able to change the ramping, the the elevations wouldn't work out with that change with the with the ramp location and, and the necessary um, ramping between levels. Alex, on the, the south, I'm going to call it the south side, um, the lower end, yeah, in that area, if you were to eliminate or add an entrance to a, a lower level there uh, and eliminate the other three um, on the right side of the garage, would that not uh, alleviate that concern? This area is buried into the health slope right now. Existing grade is about, I believe, four or five feet above the garage level on this southern face. So we aren't actually able to connect the garage at that level. We, lo we looked at that at one point, but but the grades do not work um, with the current. There's a landscape berm here existing that we're preserving. Mm -hmm. And it is important to know, I, I, so if we do add another tier, whether above or below, it would obviously uh, increase the parking. Um, we won't be able to get to, uh, a, a point where we are at 
code compliant if this goes full medical office, which I, I mentioned it's likely um, it would not. It, it's more likely to air, you know, be more leaning towards professional officer lab, which has a lighter use. The plan that's currently proposed today, we do feel does give the right amount of parking um, at that just slightly above three per thousand parking ratio for what the anticipated use of the building is. Do you plan to charge for the parking? We do not, no. So, I mean, it, you know, coming from the world of commercial office development, part of this is, is our ROI standpoint. So, you know, in defense of the developer to put another level on, it becomes increasingly more expensive. Higher you go up, it, the, your, your costs start going up exponentially. So particularly if they're not going to be getting any revenue on the parking garage, there's no, the ROI is, is, is de minimis. So I think that's, that's the practical, that's the practical obstacle. I think that from a developer standpoint that they're facing, mm -hmm. I think, they, I think given, given the circumstance, I think they, I think you guys did a really good, nice job with your plan. Thank you. And we will, the intent, um, I don't recall if, uh, if Bob or I mentioned it, but if we are granted the, uh, the zoning approval, we'll certainly obviously be back in front of you on land development. So that would really be the next step after uh, zoning hearing board. <clears throat> Any other staff comment? Um, I mean, the, the question, uh, my question is, do, from from what we've heard tonight, is there a feeling that we should move from neutral to some other stance on this? The reason we were the reason we were neutral was we, I think we felt the zoning hearing board has the responsibility and the judgment to do to either grant these reliefs and waivers or not, and it's not in our purview to do that. Uh, so that's why we. I believe that's why we decided we were neutral. So have we heard something tonight that would change our opinion on being neutral to this, as this goes before the zoning hearing board in this next week? Could you, could you uh, repeat the three variance requests? The three changes, right? Or yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the three variance requests, two of them stay the same as were reviewed last month and one changes. So there's setback relief. Yeah. Thank you. There's setback relief for structured setback from property lines. The property line is this rectangular line I'm tracing today. Yes. Uh, we're 43.39 feet on the southern side and the eastern side were 17.17. As we noted, the, the property directly across here is remnant land from the subdivision when this property and 259 were one parcel. And then you get into the Radnor bus depot. And then on this side, on the Southern side, obviously 259 has their parking directly up against the loop road as well. No, that's, that's fine. I, I just want to, just a summary summary of the request. So the and then the 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 variance from structure building and structure area since the parking garage classifies okay. as a structure, the building and structure area goes up to forty two point four percent, and then we have the minimum landscaped area variance, which is now twenty nine point four percent, which was the the subject of the change um, from last month. So yeah, thank build, you. Thanks, Alan. Building Allie. area, minimum landscape area, and setback. Thank you. And you're not, and part of your plan, you're not taking down any mature trees or anything like that. There is there is tree removal as part of the plan. There's existing landscaping within the existing parking field. And you can see there's landscape, there's um, parking lot trees throughout this yeah. area, which the garage yeah. is going on top of. But but the perimeter, you're keeping the mature mm -hmm. trees around this way, you're gonna have a buffer zone. Uh, from from uh, King of Prussia Road and yeah on the on the opposite side of the loop road this corridor is remaining all the same and all these trees along the road that screen the site are all remaining as well. 
And you guys would have to come before Shatree as well as planning when you have land development. Correct. So Correct. We'll be applying to Shatree as well. So yeah. Matt, are you asking whether this the planning commission should support the request for variance or not? I our position last time, Steve, given the information we got last month, with, and we got a little more information mm -hmm. this time, was we would remain neutral because it's it's more appropriate for the zoning hearing board to to deal with this. And then once they deal with it, it comes back to us if they grant these reliefs. Okay. All right. So I, I mean, if, if, if it's, if we want to change that, I'd fully support the request for variances. I think they've done a really nice job at trying to uh, make this building much more viable and, and uh, tuck the parking garage and kind of where it needs to be and uh, made a lot of improvements to the entry. So, I mean, I would, if the board is, well, wants, you could, wants to you, change your opinion. I, you, I, can, I, you can make a motion thusly, Steve. I mean. Okay. Let's, but can, well, one second, uh, Steve. Uh, what's the incremental um, uh, parking spot, uh, parking count? How many additional versus, how many additional spaces will be there with your design versus what's there now? This plan, now that we lost the 10 stalls from last month, we are now increasing it by 156 stalls on the property. And so where's the ingress, egress on um, King of Prussia Road again? I, I'm just, my thought is right now, is just focusing on the track, how much, you know, Rainer Chester, or excuse me, King of Prussia Road right now is, you know, it's, it's getting busy and it's gonna get even busier. It is what it is, but that's something I think we, you know, we should still kind of think about. And David, to to respond to that, we so we did have our traffic engineer provide uh, an initial opinion um, when we uh, set out to look at this project. It was his opinion that um, that we're not because we're not expanding or changing the use of the building that the the traffic is unchanged, and because we're also not adding uh, or subtracting any of the, the existing ingress and egress from the site from a, a car perspective that wouldn't, um, wouldn't change and actually adding parking helps reduce the amount of traffic. Uh, but as part of the land development review, the, the township did determine that a, a traffic impact study uh, will be required and we are going to do that as part of land development. I have a quick comment here on um, two things. First of all, is there a reason why Loop Road couldn't come around and have a one way in, one way out so that you enter on King of Prussia Road and you exit on Radnor Chester because that's you're coming around that curve there and it's I've seen a lot of people slam on brakes trying to make them way in and out. And the other thing is I feel like with all these variants being requested and this huge amount of, of um, impervious space, I would really think it would be nice to look at the ability to put another level on there, especially because you have so many ways to get in and out of that garage. And I think that it is, I, I support what Kevin was saying. You know, I, I have a quick question as a follow-up. Um, again, this is history on the board and hearing uh, this property discussed many times. Um, are you going to retain in any way a leasehold interest for additional parking like uh, Penn Medicine did apparently to deal with some staff parking or overflow parking? We were not intending to. And part of adding the, the parking garage on this site is to, because in, you know, really what that does is takes your kind of parking burden and puts it on another adjacent site. We wanted to take the, the, you know, the full parking burden on this site within the, within the confines of the property without spreading it out to other, uh, other nearby properties. The reason I said that is that that would go speak right to the uh, issue of uh, traffic increase. If you're not keeping all the parking, including off-site parking, then you are uh, actually keeping fundamentally the same parking that you had before or a little less, if anything. It seems to me because you, you don't have that overflow lot that they had rented or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the, the opinions from the traffic engineer as well with, with adding this parking, what it does from a traffic perspective is 
when a site is very tight, you have a tendency for for people to drive in, look for spots, end up exiting again and kind of circling the site multiple times. When you have the correct amount of parking, they go in, find their spot, park, and and really get out. So it does. Um, this should uh, decrease the you know the the traffic burden. Well, the traffic encircling the site is not clogging King of Prussia Road or Radnor Chester, unless you mean you go have to go out on the street to get back in. Yeah, there more. You know, their opinion was, um, you know, if you take the like, say, you take the loop road out and try to to enter back again, that then creates a little bit of a uh, of a challenge. Okay. So folks, uh, what do we want to do here? Um, <clears throat> last month, we voted to approach this uh, in a neutral position uh, as this goes to the zoning hearing board. Um, maybe that's changed, I don't know. Does somebody want to put forth a motion one way or the other to either remain neutral or take another position? Matt, do we need to ask for public comment again? Yes, we do. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to figure this one out eventually. <laughs> any hands up, Ian? I am not seeing any hands raised. All righty. Stephen, you thought you might make a move? Well, I, I, I would make a motion to support the uh, variance, variances that uh, uh, they're requesting to uh, the setbacks, the building and structure area, and the uh, landscape coverage. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, there you go, Trish. Six to one. I think we're unanimous, right? No, six no. to one. Lou no. said no. Lou said no. And I just else? feel like we should look at the impervious surface a little bit more based on all that's been going on and how we've looked at these projects in the past. Well, I think, I mean, it'll come back to us. Yeah, and so. more studies of the traffic and some of the zoning. I'd like to hear the zoning board first. So I'm just not ready to, to, to say yes quite yet. Got it. Sorry. That's fine. I just I want to just make sure it's it's six to one, correct? Right. Okay. Thank you. Mary, it, you're on isn't Dennis. it five to one? No, it's six. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, 236 North Aberdeen Avenue. It's a minor final subdivision plan. And it's a subdivision of property and construction of new twin dwelling unit. Um, who's up for that, Christy? Yes. Uh, good evening. I am Christy Flynn, and I'm before you tonight in a little bit of a different capacity than my typical. Uh, 236 North Aberdeen is uh, my property uh, at the existing home there uh, with my husband. And I'm here tonight with Jim Musselman from Yon Engineering to discuss this subdivision. Uh, we are proposing a new pair of twins, so two semi-detached single family homes uh, on the property. And I can orient you here with what we're proposing. North Aberdeen Avenue is down along the bottom of your screen here. This is the one-way section of North Aberdeen that heads sort of from east to west and then turns and goes out under the railroad bridge to Lancaster Avenue. Um, and we are proposing twins to front onto that existing street um, with the associated stormwater facilities uh, in the rear yard there. Uh, currently, there is an existing single family home set up in the front uh, corner along the, the road there, and then a large driveway down into the rear yard. 
it is a pretty straightforward application. We have received two review letters and I can go through those uh, items if you have any questions. Most of them are, the items are requesting um, additional details on things like driveway apron and sidewalk, those sorts of things. There are a couple of items that we should discuss. Um, there are two waivers that we are going to request. The first is for the um, showing the significant man-made features within 500 feet of the site. And the second we came to after discussion with your traffic professionals regarding the minimum distance of five feet from a property line for a driveway. We feel that that's just an area of your code that doesn't really accommodate this building type where you have a shared wall. Um, and so certainly we could separate those driveways, but that would mean basically a larger curb cut um, and a bigger interruption in the, the street there. And so we, we would request uh, your recommendation of a waiver to that minimum distance. Um, is it, Matt, how, how about I highlight the items that I wanted your feedback on or would you? Sure, that, that, that would be fine. I mean, or the steep slopes, uh, Christy issue, <laughs> is that something you could talk about? I Sure, I, I can tap um, our engineer in, but I think really the answer is it's a bad survey point. The area that we're talking about is so small that it's just bad data. Like if you stick a survey stake on top of a six inch high rock and measure two feet away from it, you're going to get a steep slope. And that's really what we have. It's this small area that's, I mean, it's where my kids grow their strawberries. Um, it's, it's such a tiny area that we're talking about. So what we would propose is to go gather a little bit more detailed information in that particular area. And I think that it's not going to turn out to actually be a steep slope in the end. Okay. Jim, do you want to correct me on any of that? No, that's correct. Uh, the, the survey, we should have looked when we plot, when we hatched the steep slope, but basically the surveyor drew the con or interpolated the contours from the top of the sidewalk when that's not at the grade, there's a bit of a retaining wall or a vertical face there on the side of the sidewalk. Um, so that uh, 376 contour doesn't e exist back there. Um, so once that goes away, the 374 gets closer to the sidewalk, the 372 kind of fans a little closer. Um, so yeah, basically what Christy said, if we're, we're just gonna get that distance to the ground from the top of sidewalk and that should resolve that steep slope. Does that make sense? Yeah. To everyone, okay. Yeah, I, I, I see it. Um, this, this, the situation is that, um, if, if you can picture the street is high and it's a, um, most of the homes on this side of the street, this is the low side of the street. So these are walkout basements. It's high going to low front to back across, across the sidewalk or across the lots here. And then this is just the, the sidewalk is elevated above the surrounding grade there. It's a big concrete step. Um, let's see, there is a requirement or an item in your subdivision ordinance that allows for the board of commissioners to request additional right of way. And I'm gonna uh, go here. We'd like your clarification on whether you think that's appropriate. Um, this is a one way street. And if the right of way were widened, um, as this code would allow, it would go through my next door neighbor's front porch. Um, so it doesn't get the township really much progress. And so we'd ask for clarity on that. Well, well um, Christy, so it, the, the, or the township staff, was there a request made by the township for, for you folks to consider this or? Matt, that's comment two on my review letter. 
and it's a standard comment that is typically in every land development plan that we review because as Christy said, the uh, commissioners have the right to request additional uh, right of way for a project that fronts an existing street. Yeah, and, just and, and I agree that if you would get the, the required right of way that the code allows, it would be through the neighboring structures. Yeah, I mean, think that the houses are tight to the street already. Yes. So. That's correct. Um, so, go ahead. No, go ahead. The um, other item that is listed on the Gannett Fleming uh, letter is number six. That's a will comply. We have we will add a buffer. I think that the, the comment is just a little bit nebulous. And so I clarified, um, this is regarding buffer screens. And so we will add a buffer screen along the Western property line. There's a single family detached home on the West side. And then all of the homes on the other three sides are um, like they're twins, they're all like the proposed use. And so buffers are not required between like uses. But we and, will and add all, that. No, are you, will you all have to come before Shade Tree? We will, yes. Because, of, because of grading, the, the volume of grading. Yeah, because we, we, uh, we have some opinions about how buffer screens. So it, it, we don't all agree on Shade Tree that, you know, a long line of, uh, a hedge is necessarily the right thing to do sometimes. So we would probably, you'd probably get some input from us about some other types of, maybe, you know, other types of plantings, not just a, what people would think is a traditional buffer screen, which, you know, could enhance view shed and stuff. So, but that that's for later. But well, yeah, we'll, we will be before um, shade three uh, because of the volume of, of grading that we have to do. So we can get the, the feedback then. But you wouldn't, you will not be coming before us again. I wouldn't expect to be in front of the planning commission. Right. Um, the, I think those are really the, the items for discussion. We do have to get a sewer planning module because there is still a limited connection, a connection management plan in place in the downstream uh, sewer conveyance. And so that's probably our longest lead time in getting that through downstream uh, providers and then through the DEP. But of course that would be in place before we could uh, move ahead with development. Right, have you had any interaction with neighbors? Well, you might remember uh, uh, 18 months ago or so, we were before you asking for a recommendation to keep the existing home and to build a single family detached home on the side yard. And so during that time, we spent a tremendous amount of time speaking with neighbors. And, uh, you know, sadly, in our opinion, that, that variance wasn't granted. And so we are here with this buy right application. Um, so um, that is what the neighbors said that they preferred when we were before the zoning hearing board, they preferred the buy right twin. Okay. Any? Yeah, so could you, um, Christy, step back through the points? Yes. So the first point you made was about the driveways being five feet from the property line. Yes. So that means they would be 10 feet apart? So what, what the code says is that the driveways have to be 10 feet from the property line. And it doesn't differentiate between the property line with the unrelated neighbors and the property line that runs down the middle of the two units. And so the code would say, you have to split these apart by 10 feet, which we could do, but we just don't think it's the best answer. And so we would ask that you would recommend that waiver. Well, I, I think it would, I mean, the purpose of it is to avoid this big expanse of pavement, isn't it? I don't know that it's to, you know, what the point of it is, I think what, the result would be would be that the cur this this basically results in the 
curve radius coming into the driveway being shared in this location, what we really are going to do, there'll be a run of river rock here so that it's separated. It's not a shared drive. It's, it is going to have separation, but it ends up with this being shared, a shared space rather than having to have a curve radius going out on this side and a curve radius going in on this side and really elongating this depression in a way that's unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, I guess the obvious question is, why wouldn't you just put the driveway on the other side of the house? We could, but again, the parking on this street is at a premium. We are trying to make the smallest opening possible to disrupt the on-street parking in this location. And this was, this was the way that we were able to solve that smallest access. Just so the planning commission understands, uh, this is your only bite at the apple, right? This minor subdivision will not be back before you. Uh, so if there's any concerns or anything you want to see on the plan, I mean, now is the time that you would do that. Yes, uh, I, I, this seems like a very a real challenge to your design to have such a wide expanse of concrete. Well, so think of this, um, if you could, if there was 10 feet here, that's insufficient space to parallel park a car. The, we, if we split it, there's likely not to be a parking space available. We're, we're really trying to maintain the parking. We've, one of the things that was a big deal when we were out with neighbors is the on-street parking. We did, um, in this design, we showed putting the garage doors set back a little bit. We thought that that was a nice um, way to sort of to de defocus, take the focus off of the garage doors. Um, but it, it, it is a two car, you know, it's two car garages facing the street. So Christy, you're required with would be 19 feet. Yes. So you show that. On well, the that's 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 not quite that's not quite. Steve, the parking spaces would need to be 19 feet, and we're right. proposing those in the garage. Okay. So your driveways are. Well, one's 21.58, one's 19. So I'm assuming they'll both be 19, and the difference is that river rock divider. Kurt, well, we're gonna submit the more detailed dimensions as requested in the um, Gilmore letter that shows each of those dimensions and we'll have a minimum of the 19 feet by 20 feet for the two car parking in the garage and then we will dimension the driveways to show their compliance as well. And we'll include that detail the of the of the, along with the resolution of the steep slope issue. Correct. So the, is it, <clears throat> I can't see from this plan, is this a two car garage? It is. Okay. So how wide is that driveway? It will be approximately 18 feet wide. So, so combined it's, it's 36 feet, right? Plus so a foot in the middle, so it'll be 37. 37 feet. And the water is, or the, the slope is going towards the, struct the structures, correct? Well, so the driveway will slope out towards North Aberdeen. Okay. Uh, the, the water, we wouldn't want to run the water towards the house. So yeah. the garage floor would be above North Aberdeen, but the, the green areas would slope down around to the rear. You can back out here. But North Aberdeen is higher to pot is higher than than the structure, right? Or the or the grade of the structure, correct? No, no, it'll the structure, garage, and first floor will be higher than North higher, Aberdeen. Okay, you're gonna raise it. Okay. Yeah, the existing first floor of the house is higher than the sidewalk. 
but they're the way it's laid out now there's a little dip in the front yard yeah now um, i'm looking at a photograph of, of, of the structure now is there i mean if you if you're going to go with this design rather than having a large concrete with a area with a width of 37 feet could you do something non-permeable you put in some sort of uh non-permeable uh, driveway stone crushed stone uh no i wouldn't i wouldn't want well stone is typically considered impervious as well and i don't think that's going to be an attractive maintenance scenario in this in town situation you know this is this is not a large country lot that can handle yeah. a, a stone a stone drive um you know we are below the impervious limits with those drives and the proposed um footprints of the homes um we are going to be obviously installing new stormwater systems the current paving and existing structure is completely undetained and so each home will have a new system to accommodate for the the impervious that's that's created. But I think the question before the planning commission tonight is, uh, do you want to make a recommendation based on what you see, or do you wish to? And that recommendation would be with whichever way you wish to go, or do you want to see the plan back again next month with issues resolved and, and other items on the plan? as Christy has spoken of, Ms. Lynn. So can you, um, so the first issue was the set, what's the next issue? The first issue was the, was the driveway set back from the property line. What was the next one? The steep uh, the, slope? The waiver requests were yes. the, were the um, showing the significant man-made features within 500 feet. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And then the steep slope was another? The steep slope, I think, is like I said, it's it's not an issue. It's uh, yeah. bad bad plotting. Christy, uh, Roger made a comment about the title. I have uh, updated title. Delaware County title searches are a little slow right now. Um, there are prohibitions against saloons and tanneries, um, glue factories. But nothing I about. I haven't seen it yet. I'll get it over to Mary. I think you know. I, I'm, I'm, it's great that you're developing the property, but I I, I can't support why we would uh, support a waiver of the of the driveways from the property lines. I think it this it's to avoid creating thirty seven feet of pavement which I, I understand your parking concern, but I'm not sure. I mean, unless you laid out the whole street, I'm not sure I, I would ever be able to evaluate that. But um, uh, Steve, for, your, for your information, there's a number of houses up and down Aberdeen that have shared driveways, just like the way this is shown. And, well, that could be, but that's not what before is before us, correct? They're not 37 feet though, right? Most of them are um, are probably 12 feet on each side, so they're probably 24. They're they're fit in the side yards. So, you know, in a case where there this is an existing twin, so the driveway on this property is on the property line um, here. No, but I, I guess I, I guess I don't if, unless there's some serious hardship to doing it by code. I'm not sure I understand why it's this way. Like I said, the re there's, it's the parking, is, this maximizes the parking. It does create, um, you know, a garage doesn't really need windows in a tw twin house. The wall that's shared doesn't have windows. This would allow for this to have windows, but really the driving force is minimizing the impact on neighbors, you know, for us, we own both of these halves. We have, we would have, um, we try to have some consideration that we don't go into the area that's closest to the existing neighbors was kind of the idea. Try to keep our impacts on, on our own two lots here. Christy, does the, 
whatever the separation between the driveways, how far would that come down towards the street? Well, I would imagine that it would need to get to the sidewalk and then the sidewalk would go across the throat of both driveways. So the sidewalk, that apron is your shared apron. Yes. The sidewalk is on the curb in this, on the street. So it's, uh, par it's travel lane one way, parallel parking, um, and then the sidewalk and then the yards. And so all the driveways um, have their depre a depressed area in the sidewalk um, as the apron. So Christy, for, for the planning commission's sake and for my own edification, would you just step through, I know you've stepped through it yeah. in detail, just step through what you need to do, the updates to the plans from where they sit now to where they need to be, like showing the zoning buffer um, the driveway, if you sure. could just step through that. Yeah, absolutely. So we need to show the trees for the type A buffer along this property line. We need to um, do the additional survey to adjust this existing features area here. And there was also a note um, on the connection of the topography contours. Um, and that's driven because the on-site topography contours are field surveyed compared to the, the LIDAR that they use for the surrounding properties. So those need to be smoothed out. It's just sort of two different sources. It, I mean, it looks like we're very lacking of proposed contours. Well, this is existing feature. Right, I mean, that, yeah, that's my point. No, I'm talking about on your on your other plan, sheet one. Yeah, so this is a minor subdivision and I believe that they, we have some spot elevations. The grading plan is required separately for the grading permit. Right. Um, you know, this is a situation where we are finalizing architecture for the actual homes to do a great, a very detailed individual grading plan at this stage would just be redone when we finalized the, the final exact dimensions of the, the next, of the actual architecture. And so this is enough to show that the plan will be in compliance. There's, there will be compliance, but it's not the exact specific each spot elevation. Okay, so looking at this plan, so you have a finished floor of 380.3 right, for the house on the right. Okay. And I'm just looking at those contours, the existing contours um, running down and how they're gonna tie in. I understand fully that you're gonna submit a grading permit application and all this is gonna be nailed down. Mm -hmm. But since you are so close to the other property, um, I'm curious to see how all these grades tie in. From your 372, which is six feet below, like is, you know, so it's going to be up out of the ground. Just curious. I'm not saying you don't have enough to do what you're wanting to do. Mm -hmm. These are just questions I have. Sure. How much higher is the finished floor of your structure compared to your neighbors? And do you have either a street elevation of that or are they aware of the difference in elevation between the first floors? I don't have a I, I don't have a survey of the neighbors first floor. It's just not information that's available to us. There is a like I said, the driveway here is along the property line, and it's maybe it's higher than the yard here. Um, there's a a pretty it's almost a retaining wall kind of uh, a, happening right here. Um, so this house is higher than this yard by a fair bit. And, and like I said, all of these homes have slope coming out of the back. So that's, this is a walkout of the homes in the rear. It falls high to low along the side of the house. And the house basically acts as a retaining wall for the higher front yard to the lower backyard.
um, to continue going through the things that we were going to um, update, uh, we need to label the parking spaces in the garage, the garages, and show the dimensions. Uh, label the right of way. Um, we, I suppose we'll wait to hear from the commissioners about whether they would ask for additional right of way. Uh, we will correct or label the minimum curb radii at the driveways to 10 feet. We will label all the sidewalks at their minimum of four feet dimension. We will add the street trees. We already listed the buffer. Provide the title update to your solicitor. Um, refine those contour lines from property line across property line there. You mentioned planning module approval. Do you any, anticipate any problem? Um, I don't anticipate a problem. We have capacity from RHM allocated. And so uh, we are just sort of moving downstream from there. That's typically the most difficult capacity to, to secure. And we do have that in hand. It's just a process that's greater than what it seems like it should be for a two lot subdivision to go through an entire module. Uh, but because of the downstream challenges, that's what we have to do. So, so I, I have a feel, you know, I have a, my com one comment I have is that we saw something earlier in the evening where we didn't feel that we had all the details in front of us in order to vote approve uh, a plan. And Chrissy, I, I, I totally appreciate what you're doing here and it, and it uh, but it, would it make more sense for us to see something, for instance, to know that the title was clear like so Mary's comfortable and so that um, just that the details that are missing are in our heat are before us. I mean, it would, it would even be helpful to see, I, I wrote about the street today. And, and when you, when you say there's no parking, you're not kidding. I mean, there wasn't one space on that street today at 1030. And, but a, a look at the property from the street, I think would help the commissioners here understand what you're talking about in terms of sure. the tightness. It just seems like, we, I'd like to, as a commissioner, I'd like to see a few more details like about the, what's going on and what the neighborhood looks like, you know, instead of having everyone drive over there. So I don't know, how does, there, how does the rest of, how does staff feel about this? Is this, am I being ludicrous here? Like suggesting that we delay this until all the details are in? No, I, I, I think it would be good to even see, you know, Christy, Ms. Ms. Flynn has noted, you know, that the two parking spaces are, part of the garage but that's not labeled um you do have the title thing i i think it uh would behoove everybody to see the plans fully developed as miss flynn has stated you know what what needs to be done and then the planning commission can make an accurate recommendation because we like you said steve we don't get another shot at this well yeah. i also i also think it should be we should be presented with a plan that meets the code I mean, we're being presented with a plan that doesn't meet the code if that code is five feet off the property line with driveways. Um, I'm not sure why, other than supposedly the parking on the street, but. Well, I, I think Steve, I mean, I think Christy, like having seen the neighborhood today, I sort of, I understand where Christy's coming from in terms of you, you don't, when you drive by, you don't see anything except a row of cars and houses that are really, really above the level that you are at at that point. So it would, I, I think it would just help the commission if we, if we had a little more information about how this looks in real time, because you, you know, you might, you might say, well, now I understand why they, why they want to do it this way. It's just like looking at it, like from above doesn't really, it doesn't really help. I don't think it's helping. Chris, what I'm saying is it's not helping your argument, I think, not having. I, I appreciate that. And like I said, our long lead time is our planning module. And so with this direction that you provided tonight, 
I can be before you next month with the updated plans and that have these little will comply comments taken care of. I, um, I can certainly bring images of the street or I could pull up street view this moment if you wished, if you thought that could be helpful. Um, because what I would like is, um, you know, I wanna make sure I provide you with the information that you need to be able to understand why the plan is drawn as it is, but I wouldn't like to get my plan perfected in this way that I think is the best for the street. And then you guys say, no, no, we don't, we don't agree. So um, how, how do you recommend that we do that? I, I, I think you just tie up every loose end you can and come before us next month and, and have something where we can see, we can get a feel for what, what uh, existing and living in this neighborhood is like and, sure. and, why, and why, you, why your nonconformity might make sense. Would it, be, would it be all right with you if I put on this, this uh, street view? Sure, go ahead. Uh, one, while she's doing that, one of the things I've seen other municipalities do in situations where parking's really, really tight in a neighborhood is to have a declaration of covenants providing that the garages can't be converted to a living spaces. You can't make people park in the garage, but you can prevent them from converting their garages into, into rec rooms and, and things like that. It's, just a suggestion. Yeah, that happened on the Maple 415 Maplewood. I believe they have that type of covenant marriage. Can you see this uh, Google image or? Still seeing the plan. All right, give me one second. Let me change to this thing here. Okay. So this is the property here. You can see that it's, um, wider it's there's a missing tooth on the street here and all of these homes uh twin twin single twin twin a uh, group of townhomes going that way single twins new townhouses here um and so this is the existing home and this is the street so very narrow like we had discussed and the parking all along the northern side of the street here. So on this day, there were a couple of spaces available, but it's, it's very, you know, in the evening, every space is full. None of the homes on the uh, south side of the street have driveways. And so they all rely on on-street parking as their only location for parking. And so each spot is important here. Yeah, I couldn't even see the sidewalk. There are so many cars on the street today. Right, and then there's, there's an example of sort of a, one of those driveways that we were talking about where driveway for home A and driveway for home B on the property line. That's the question I have. It, it seems like your plan is sort of the opposite of how it's set up on the on the rest of the street, and it may well be that that's a better way, as you were talking to. But I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And I think somebody mentioned at least seeing where in that footprint the garage is on on the, on the plan, even if you don't have the full architectural rendering, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. We can provide that. And so if we were to put the, pro the, so if we were to put the garage on the outside of the house, what you would end up with is, this is the property line right here, right? So then you'd have 10 feet, then you'd have a two car garage. So this is, in, this is, takes away a parking space here. Then there would be no parking in front of the driveway. Then there would be um, the yard. And so there'd probably be a parking space there, but then another driveway there. Um, so it would break up those parking spaces in a way that probably um, 
leads to much less parking than what we would be talking about with them together. And like I said, keeping those impacts farther away from the neighbors that exist was really part of the goal. So we can um, update those plans and resubmit. I think that would, I, I don't I don't want to speak for the rest of the commission, but that sounds like a, a good plan from my perspective. Christy, if you could just um, so you'll be on for May 3rd, if you could get them to Trish slash Gannett Fleming Gilmore as soon as I don't want you to come back when they haven't had a chance to review. I just oh, no, this, is, this should take a this should be a. a quick turnaround because it's minor stuff that we're talking about. Very good. So we don't have to. But I, I don't think the driveway issue is a minor thing. I mean, you need to you need to resolve that or lay out the parking on the street. And if that's the argument, then you'll have to lay out the parking on the street. You know? Just looking down the street, just to give you guys an idea, there are a lot of shared driveways along this street. There's a couple that are separated just by a fence. So it looks like, I, I don't know if this code came in later than when these houses were, but it could have been that a lot of these other houses were granted a um, waiver also for the driveway issue. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I, I, I don't think I don't think we ought to hang this project up because of the the driveways. I, I, I this is a this is a pretty unique street in, in Radnor, and the traffic, the vehicular issues are 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 not are not they're real. This is not Christie's not making this up. So I, I I don't you know I don't know if I don't know I don't I'm not sure the driveways are are a deal breaker. I mean I mean the commission. We'll vote on it, but I, I right now I'm leaning to I would lean to approve the driveways. I don't know how anyone else feels about it, though. except Steve. I know how you feel. So anyway, so do we? Where, where do we go from here at this point? So I think the applicant has agreed to table it till or to table till next month. So I don't think there's any action on your part. It's up to table. Uh, okay. Uh, any other commissioner commission comment? Commissioner comment? Staff one, comment? One last thing, uh, Ms. Flynn. I got. I have to check, but will we need any kind of extension? I don't know, but if you do, we we will grant it. Thank you. Is there any public comment? Yeah, there's a few hands raised for this one. Uh, first public comment is Diane Engelbert. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Diane. Hi there. Yes, I am one of Christie's neighbors. Hi, Diane. Uh, hi there. Uh, and I do have concerns about losing parking um, because there is so little parking on this street. Uh, and I wondered, Christy, are you keeping the existing driveway? Uh, the existing driveway is likely to be a part of the new driveways if they stay where they are. Um, it would be shifted if they are split. And if st keeping them where they are, was that your plan to try to take up less parking? That was my goal. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, you know, we've, I've lived there a very long time and understand the, the um, concerns of the neighbors. And so that was certainly our goal to minimize the impact. Well, I hope your goal still is to minimize the impact. I was just wondering, um, you know, because I can't read plans. I was just wondering if you could use the existing driveway and have the, and have have the parking be in uh, the back of the house instead of in the front of the house, eating up the parking. 
It, it wouldn't work to keep the existing driveway because the homes have to be attached. When we had proposed those two singles, we had proposed um, a shared drive that ran to the back because they were split and we could go through the middle uh, of the two separate homes. Diane, if you remember, I, I showed you that plan, but with the attached homes, we can't really get to the back. It doesn't really work. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is really the, the result of having to do the twins. So how many parking spaces? You know, there's three up at the top. There's two to the lower side of your existing driveway. How many parking spaces will we lose? So if the existing curb cut is about 12 feet wide, um, there the new curb cut will be about we said 37 so the difference there is about 25 which is one parking space so you're saying one that in a bit hmm? one in a bit because a parking what's a on-street parking 24 steve parallel parking's 24 wide 22 okay so one and a little bit well one and a little bit essentially means two Depending on how it lines up with the other parking spaces that it's nearby, yes. Yeah, so I think we're losing two parking spaces, which actually is huge for us here because none of us on my side have any parking. As you very pro appropriately mentioned, none of us have parking. Now, one thing that could help ease that was, and I have no idea who owns that property across from you. Do you have any idea who owns all that parking up there across from you? It's just sold, so I don't know the new owner now. Well, okay, who owned it before? Um, who was the, um, there was a guy named Gene that owned it when we first moved here and then it sold once and now it's sold again. I don't know. No, I mean, which house, which property does it belong to? Oh, it belongs to the, the McCurry, former McCurry property that's the corner. Okay. So, I could go to that. So that when that was a bar a million years ago, that was the parking for the bar. Uh, that was before my time when it was a bar, but that would be my guess. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't before my husband's time. He, since <laughs> we've been in the house for seventy years. Um, anyway, so I just was wondering about how much parking we're going to lose. But yeah, there's there's the picture of that parking, and so it belongs to that property that I'm looking at right there. That used to have like a dentist, some kind of a a, a practice in the bottom. That's so, right. Yep. And and that just got sold to, and you don't know who owns it. Correct. And so that pro that parking all belongs to them. That's right. Okay. So there's no chance that that could become parking for the street, I guess. I wouldn't. No one ever. That, that's I don't have control there. over that. No. No one ever. No one ever parks in that spot. So it's really, it really painful to see that that is that the situation. Plus, the parking around the corner is never is rarely it's used a little bit more for the apartments that are in that building there. So we're. I'm hoping that you can do the best possible that you can do to keep it at one space and not not one and a little but one space yeah so diane i think what i can do is i can show what the dimensions would be with the driveways together and with the driveways separate and we can pick hopefully um we can do the one that leads us to the the least impact and and it'll be more than just my i'll do some math and it'll be more than just my um my amateur explanation but I'll, I'll show it so that everybody can see it well your explanations are not amateur uh, everything is much over my head but all I know is that it's a constant struggle to find parking and that's all that I know and your uh, Matt when he said he rode up the street today I appreciate that he saw wall-to-wall -wall cars because normally that's how it looks so thank you thanks Diane okay um, do I just unraise my hand to, to say goodbye? I believe so. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Ian? Also have Patty Conlin with hand raised. Uh, 
Hi, this is Patty Conley. Hey, I'm um, a resident of Radnor Street Road. I just wanted to find out, um, does the uh, maximum impervious surface meet the zoning requirements with this new layout? The answer is yes, it does. Is this R3 zoned? Um, it is R5 actually. Okay, thanks. That's it. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, that is all the public comment I am seeing. Okay, I, I guess what Christy will see you in May. Great. And uh, Steve, is there anything else for us to do uh, on this project tonight? No, sir. Okay. Can we all? You know, if I could just make one more comment, you know that the. the the 500 feet of you know creating a drawing that shows everything in 500 feet might be beneficial here but i hate to burden anyone with that <laughs> but if you want to show the street christy i, I i'm sure you can uh, figure out some way to do that so we well, do I, I think without, relevant, so, without having to show everything in 500 feet yeah i think the relevant question is really how does the geometry of the parking spaces change and that's really about the sort of the property line frontage to the next, you know, sort of interruption in parking. And I, I think that I will plan to be before you with that. And I, I'll still ask for the 500 feet, feet waiver, but I'll get the relevant piece for you. So yeah, we can, I, I just did some back of the envelope here, and I, I think I'm, I think I'm right, but I'll, I'll draw it out so that everybody can see what we're talking about. All right, that sounds great. Thanks. Thank you all. Have a great night. Um, Matt, before before we finish this one, we do have one more public comment. Okay. Uh, from Roberta Winters. My comment is for the close of the meeting. This isn't relevant to this specific instance. Sure, Roberta. Can I give it to you now? Okay. I really appreciate all you're doing to maintain the quality of our life here in Radnor. And I appreciate the detail you're going into on all of these cases that are brought before you. And it appears to me that there may be several land development projects that are being proposed that will change the overlay district in the Garrett Hill community. And I would encourage members of the planning commission to visit our neighborhoods and we would be happy to provide guided tours on request so that you may actually see what's going on in the community before you have these decisions brought before you, okay? Thank we you. love uh, site visits, Roberta, so we'll take you up on that. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. So I have, I have a question. Um, for the 236, do we do we take a vote for that for no, tabling? we did not, we just, yeah, we didn't make any action on it. She, she's going to, Christy will come before us and- Table it till May. Till May. Right, right. Okay. Hey, Matt, I'm sorry. I have one question maybe for Christy, just, just to clarify. Christy, are you still there? I'm here. So Christy, just so I understand this whole driveway issue. Sure. Driveway itself to accommodate uh, two two car garages. Yes. So is there any possibility that the curb cut could be reduced even though it wouldn't match the garage itself? It would be difficult to navigate that. There's a turnaround that's required. Um, there's a dimension behind each parking space that's required. And I don't believe this, you know, this, this is again, not a place with big setbacks, huge yards. It's a small, infill lot and there's not really room to have that sort of narrowing down of the driveway in a, a way that makes the the um, maneuvering of the cars really feasible. Is there enough room between the street and the garage to put a car that's not in the garage? Yes. Just one, right? Well, so one deep, 
um, side by side, two side by side. Does that mean four total could be? If, if we had two in the garage and two in the drive, that would be four. Uh, say it again. I'm just looking, I'm just going. How about I, if how about I put this plan, plan back up really quickly? All right, so the, the front yard is a 25 foot front yard setback. Mm -hmm. So the sidewalk is beyond the, is here. Mm -hmm. And so then in the driveway, you could fit a car and a car and you would have a car and a car in the garage. Mm -hmm. And then for this home, and then the next door home could have two cars in the garage right. and two cars in the driveway. Right. And so, we we would like to keep the guest parking because certainly we wouldn't want to then if we had guests come to the to the house we wouldn't want to take up on street parking then as well. So I think it makes sense to have that additional space there. So just going back to the comment earlier, I think maybe Mary made it. Uh, is there something you would do at this point with regard to uh, curtailing uh, any ability of those homeowners to ever convert the garage to a rec room or something different than a garage? Sure. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a like sort of uh, philosophical belief that we shouldn't try to assume we know what's going to be going on in a hundred years and these like forever restrictions, you know, might lead to unintended consequences down the road. But on a practical basis, if you would like me to restrict the, the garages, I'll restrict the garages. Though there's not really a homeowners association proposed. So there's not, a, I guess it would be a deed restriction that you would ask for a recording. It could be listed on the plan, but then some, there would have to be somebody who would take action to enforce it. And I guess that would be the township if it became a problem. Yeah, normally if there's no HOA, you do it by declaration of covenants that gets recorded against the property and it inures to the benefit of the township and it can be extinguished if the township and the homeowner both agree. We would agree to that. Okay, then. So, Mr. Chair, do we have any other business? Matt, you're muted. Matt. Sorry about that. Was, the only thing I'll say is that I've, I've had a couple conversations in the last month with people who, business owners who feel like some of our code, like the Wayne Business Overlay District Ordinance and the comprehensive plan and some other things are woefully out of date and not um, don't actually, um, reflect the way we live today. Um, and I was going to put on new business next month, an agenda item where we would not spend a lot of time on this, but just to get a feeling for how the commission would feel about taking, a, you know, trying to figure out, do we want to like look at our code and maybe update our code? Or do we want to try to, how do we, how would we approach that? Or are, as a planning commission, are we even interested and having that, starting that conversation. Um, obviously it would have to go before the board of commissioners if we were gonna do something like that. But uh, it's something that I think some of us have thought about over time, like our, the comprehensive plan, I believe is 2000, is 1998. And I think part, some of the other code is 2003. So it's, uh, it, it is it, I don't know if it's truly reflective of, of how we live today. 
some of the parts of the code. So, and I don't think, uh, you know, you want a spot zone. So I don't think you want to approach it like piecemeal. So I think it's, I was just gonna put, if you guys are okay with it, put that on the agenda for, for May to just start a discussion, not spend an hour talking about, it, but just just get the, get sort of a feeling of other members of the commission, how they, how they feel about like, if we wanted to even start that process. That's, so that's what I intend to do. Any, anybody have any, I really don't feel like getting into it right now, but I just think it's something that we, as planning commission, maybe we should think about that stuff. But the Philadelphia redid their zoning code. It took them three and a half, four years. So, and that's all I have. Um, so do I need to take a vote to uh, adjourn? Or do we just adjourn? <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Second. <laughs> hey, thanks, everyone. Thank for. Thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you next. Uh, see you in May. Yeah. Thank.